chapter 15.5, we're going to be talking about triple integrals. And the important idea in this section is that triple integration is really just a natural extension of what we've already been doing with iterated integration from single integrals to double integrals and now triple integrals. And so the process of what we're doing is exactly going to be the same. All right, so that's some good news. The evaluation, the way we the way we brute force work through an integral is going to be using the exact same techniques. The difference here is really the interpretation, the geometric meaning of what's going on. So I want to spend some time talking about that. So let's talk about the geometric meaning of what all these trick uh, meaning of what's going on. So we began in calculus one with single integrals of a function of one variable, dx, and that gave us the area under a curve. So that was the idea behind a single integral. Then we moved on to double integrals. So a double integral of a function of two variables over an area differential. So we integrated over an area Right, and that was the, uh, that gives the volume under a surface. And then the new one, right, so this new one we're talking about, the third extension, is a triple integral of a function now of three variables over not a area differential, but now we're doing a volume differential. So we do a dv. And remember, we would integrate over some region r. Now, in triple integrals, we call it a volume d. Right? So d is the generic name for the volume that we're going to integrate over. Uh, and here, this function that we're integrating, the output of this function, right? if you take in three independent variables, x, y, and z, the output of f is actually going to live in the fourth dimension. So output of, of f is uh, in 4D. Right, so we're going to be talking about the geometric meaning of these, but when we get to triple integrals and beyond, kind of the, the ability to visualize and have a geometric understanding of what's going on will start to degrade. So we're not going to be able to come up with good visuals for the outputs of, of triple integrals, um, but we are going to start to talk about integrals on higher dimensions that we can even really visualize. And so the output of a triple integral is, I mean, what's one dimension higher than volume? Some, four, some 4D quantity, which we don't really have a name for. So it's a 4D or, you know, quantity. It's a 4D quantity contained in a, a 3D volume, right, where that 3D volume is the volume of integration that we're going to integrate over. And so I know this sounds very confusing, and it's just kind of these big nebulous ideas, but there are applications of triple integrals. So that is something to remember. Like, there are, there are applications of these. So there are applications of triple integrals. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So if you look here, here's an example of a volume you could integrate. All right, so this would be D, right? And it's even, even labeled here. So D is that volume of integration that we talked about here. So you would integrate through this volume you would integrate this four-dimensional function. So the four-dimensional function would live somewhere in a, in a higher dimension that we can't even see, and you're capturing some parts of it in this 3D volume, and you're adding them up, uh, and that would give you some four-dimensional quantity. But there are some practical applications that we can visualize and think about and have a good understanding for, and there's two, two main ones that we'll talk about. So the first one here is triple integrals can give you the volume of the region of integration if, and you remember from last chapter, there was a certain function that when we integrated it, when we integrated a certain function, it told us something about the region of integration. Or you remember we could find the area of the region of integration 
if our function was 1. So we can, uh, triple integrals can give you the volume of the region of integration if the function you integrate is exactly 1. So if it's just 1. That is to say that your function has to equal 1, like this. And so the, the formal way of writing this idea out is that volume of a region D, right, so of D, is equal to the triple integral over D of 1 dV, right, and that's our differential in volume. And really this dV uh, expands to be, uh, right, dV is really dz dx dy. And remember, we can use Fubini's fifth theorem to say that the order of integration doesn't matter. We could do dx dy dz. We could do dy dz dx. They're all equivalent. Typically, though, uh, as a note, typically you're going to want to do dz first. So do dz first. Uh, and the reason for that is that we're used to writing surfaces that bound volumes in the form z equals something. So you can see that here. This volume is bounded by two curves in the z direction. One surface is z equals a function of, of two variables on the top, and that kind of gives us this curve top. And then the second one that bounds the bottom is z equals a function of two variables, and that gives us our curved bottom here. And so typically, if you're writing it in that form, z equals a function of two variables, you want that to be the first one you integrate, so you can have those two variables to integrate later. So for that reason, we typically are going to want to do dz first, but you could equivalently do dx dy dz or dy dz dx or any, any combination of those. Now let's look at the second big application of triple integrals. So secondly, triple integrals can actually give you the mass of a shape. So the region you're integrating, if, and this is a new idea, if the function you integrate if the function you integrate is what's called a density function. And you know you're working with a density function because it will always be written like this. The syntax for a density function is this. So you don't have f of x, y, z, it looks like this curly D. And what that is, is that's the Greek letter delta. Right, so that's Greek lowercase delta. Because that way you have like a, a, a density, whoops, a density function. Right, and so that's how you can recognize it. So it'll always be written in, in that form. So for example, you could have density, now let me write it full out, so the density at every point is equal to 3. This would be a case where it's constant, so this is the constant case. What this would mean is that at every point, x, y, and z, in your shape, so at all these individual points, the density is a uniform 3. So the way we could solve that and get the mass is we could just find the volume. We could find the volume of the region and multiply it by the density, because volume times density would give you the mass. Right? If we remember, the units of density are the units of density are right, it's mass per volume. Right, so if you multiply that by a volume, we can do a stoichiometric analysis, and that just gives us mass. Right, and that's what an integral does. An integral is the multiplication of some function, and if this function is a density function, it is 
the units are mass per volume times dv, a differential in volume, you're adding up infinitesimally small volumes uh, times a density that will output a mass. Right, so that's the mass of the shape. Now this one's pretty easy. If it's a constant um, density throughout the entire region, then you could just find the volume and multiply by a constant density to get the mass. But what if you had a case, um, here's like first example, second example, could be a density function that looks like this. What if it's 3z? So now this is a variable density. So you can no longer just find the volume of the region and multiply by the density because the density is not uniform throughout the shape. What this means is, is a density equal to 3 times z is that the density in this shape is equal to 3 times its height. Right, so if this, for example, was at a height of, right, if this was like z equals 1, for example, so z equals 1, then the density here would be 3 times 1 is 3. So like right here, it'd be around 3. But as you progressed up through the shape, it would get more and more and more dense as z increased until you got to the most dense part up here at the top where z is biggest. And right, so this would be um, the most dense part of the shape. So you, you kind of have this, um, you have this gradient of densities going up through the shape from, from the lightest right, to the heaviest. So you need calculus in order to add up all of those uh, infinitely small changes in the density of the, of the shape. And so we can use the application of triple integrals to find that. So we know, uh, if we were to write out a formula for this, that the mass, that the mass of d, that's equal to the triple integral over d of a density function times dv. All right, so that's the other big application of triple integrals. So now that we have these two big ideas for finding volume and for finding mass, let's apply them to some problems. So in this first example, we're just going to evaluate a triple integral. And so the evaluation is exactly the same that we've been doing for single and double integrals. You just have one more time to repeat it. And so we're still going to work from the inside out. Right, so we'll do the dx first. These are x bounds, dy, those are y bounds, and then dz. These are z bounds. <clears throat> so let's just do a quick evaluation. We have 1 to e, 1 to e squared. Um, and right, verify that e, e cubed, e squared, and e, those are just numbers, right? That Those aren't variable. Those are just uh, a number. Like e is, is 2 point. There's seven or something, or one point seven. I can't remember. E squared. These are these are all just numbers. Uh, and so this innermost one, we are integrating with respect to x. So we treat y and z like constants. You could treat y like seven and z like two. Those are just numbers. So the integral of one over x times some constant is just going to be the natural log of x over whatever was in the denominator. So that's y z. Right. And that will be evaluated from 1 to e cubed, dy, dz. And then what does that become? So we plug in, plug in e cubed uh, to the top, and we get the natural log of e to the 3, which is just 3, over yz, uh, minus 0. Right. So that's just going to become, we have 1 to e, 1 to e squared. What does that become? 3 over yz dy dz. Uh, what is that? So now we're just going to do the exact same thing again. 1 to e. Okay, so the integral of 3 over yz with respect to y, that is also just going to become 3 natural log of y over z uh, evaluated from 1 to e squared dz. Right, so we plug in e squared for y, 3 times the natural log of e squared is just 2, 
So this whole thing becomes, uh, now we just have one to E of six, right? Two times six over Z. Uh, and then, yeah, you can do, you can do it from here. That just comes out to be six, right? You should be able to see that. So that's how we evaluate triple integrals. It's the exact same iterative process, just with one more step. So pretty easy. This exercise here, this is a really good one. So I remember we talked about that typically, typically it's most beneficial to do the order of integration for triple integrals in the order dz first. So dz, dx, dy, or dz, dy, dx. Um, but there's no rule that mandates that you do it that way. It can be done in any order. So let's use uh, exercise 21 to practice changing up the order of integration. So there's, looks like there's five of them. Let's just do two. I'm gonna pick, we'll do A and let's do D. And then I'll leave it uh, to you guys to, to do the other three. So it looks like here's our region. This is D. So this is the volume we're integrating through. And all we're doing right now is we're practicing setting up the bounds of integration. So we're just practicing setting this up. Right? We're, we don't have any function to integrate. This is really just practice for setting up the integral. So it looks like it was given to us in the form dz dy dx. So they already did this one for us. This is the one I would typically default to if I were to give it or if I were to set this region up on my own. But let's try it in a different order. So we'll start with a. And a is in the, the order they want us to do the order of integration to be dy dz dx. So let's do dy dz dx. Okay, let me get three integrals. That was huge. Three integrals, dy dz dx. Okay, um, and in this case, evaluating this integral would really just give you the volume of this region because we're integrating one, right? There's just a one in there. So we're going in the y direction first. So in the y direction, it looks like if you were a particle traveling along the y-axis, right, or anywhere in the y direction, you're going to enter the region along this curve, right? So you're entering along here, right, because it's in this way first. So it looks like that's exactly the equation y equals x squared. And it's already solved in the, in the form y equals something, which is what these need to be. These need to be y equations on the first integral. So that is, you enter at y equals x squared. And then where do we exit the region? Well, we exit um, along this kind of slanted uh, top here, right? This surface. This is getting super messy. Let's clean this up a little bit. So you're exiting the region along that slanted top. Uh, and so we just need to solve it for y. In this case, it would be y equals uh, z, excuse me, 1 minus z. There we go. So we have our y bounds. Now let's do x. Wait, what's next? Oh, z. So in the z direction, it looks like we enter uh, from below on the xy plane, which is just z equals 0. And then we exit... We also exit on this top, right? But here's the trick. Because we've already integrated with respect to y, we cannot have any y's in this equation. So it's not okay to say that we exit at the surface z equals 1 minus y. Instead, we need to substitute something else in there to get it in terms of other variables that we haven't integrated with respect to yet. Otherwise, we'll be left with no, uh, variables in our final answer. So what we can do is, is we can actually just plug in that y equals x squared into our top equation to get it uh, to eliminate the y variable. So let's plug in y equals x squared into there and solve it for z. So that will give us, uh, that'll be 1 minus x squared. That gives us the top. And then in the x direction, we're just going from negative 1 to 1. That gives us, that, that encaptures the entire region. So that's from negative 1 to 1. Okay, beautiful. So that's the order dy, dz, dx. Now let's do d, letter d. And letter d is in the order dx, dz, dy. So dx, 
dz dy. One, two, three. Okay, everything's set up, ready to go. In the x direction, let me let me erase all this. So in the x direction, we're going this way. It looks like throughout the entire region, you're entering it also along that curve y equals x squared, and you're exiting on that as well. So that's going to be the bounds in the x direction. So we just need to solve this uh, in terms of x. So that becomes x equals plus or minus the square root of y. And so this plus half, the positive portion, gives you this one, right, the positive side, and then the negative part of the square root of y gives you this part of the curve. Right, so you're actually entering along the negative square root of y, exiting on the positive square root of y. So we can write that there. Square root of y, positive square root of y. And we just got that from rearranging that side equation. Next is the z direction. So in z, let me clear some of these. So in z, looks like we also enter on the xy plane, pretty easy, at zero. And we're exiting along this top equation. Right, so we exit out, uh, out the slanted top, which when we solve for z, just becomes 1 minus y. Beautiful. And then in the y direction, we just need to capture the entire region, the entire domain of the shape, which in the y direction is just going to be from 0 to 1. There goes the whole thing. Beautiful. Okay, so here are three, three equivalent ways to write this region and evaluate the integral. They'll all give you the exact same answer. Um... Like I said, this is the one I would typically default to writing it as, but you can write it as any of them. And then I'll leave it as an exercise on your own to go through the rest of these three and come up with the, the correct bounds for those orders of integration. Okay, let's look at number 23. So number 23 is a word problem. And it says the region between the cylinders Z equals Y squared in the XY plane that is bounded by the planes X equals 0, Y equals 1... Let's see. There's not really a question in here, is there? Hmm. The region between the cylinder... Oh, I think I just cut out the question. Hmm. I'm not really sure what it's asking for. This, there's, no, there's no question in this statement. I'll make one up then. I'm going to say it says find the, find the volume. So find the volume of... Dot, dot, dot. The region between the cylinder, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're just going to find the volume of this. So you're asked to find the volume between the cylinder z equals y squared and the xy plane, so that's just the flat bottom, that is bounded by the planes. So you have, now you have a lots, lots of planes, but these are pretty easy to draw. So let's, let's make a sketch of this shape that we're trying to find the volume of. So I know it's going to be three-dimensional. So I'll make some 3D axes. Okay. So let me start by drawing the cylinder Z equals Y squared. So Z equals Y squared, that's just going to be a function on the ZY plane, right? It's just like X equals Y squared, but instead of on the XY plane, it's on the ZY plane. So this is just going to be something that looks like this. Hmm. Huh. I think it's going to look like, yep, yeah, so that's z equals y squared, and because it's a cylinder, all that means is that because we're in R3, we're in 3D, we're just going to extrude that shape along the, the direction or the, the axes that isn't being used in the equation. So in that case, it's the x. So that's, here's x, y, z. So I'll, what I can do, I believe, is just copy this, paste it a little bit downrange. Can I get it to line up? Here we go. Okay, so let me just connect this like that. So there, that's the cylinder. That's like the sheet. Z equals Y squared in three dimensions. Okay. The XY plane, that's just the bottom, right? XY plane, that's just the bottom of the shape. So we're good on that. And that is bounded on the sides by the planes X equals zero, which is just the YZ plane. All right, so this is... X equals zero, and I kind of already started the shape there, so we're good. Uh, it's also bounded by X equals one. We're just going to call this 
we're just gonna say that is x equals one so i don't have to redraw it so we'll say that's x equals one uh, so that kind of gives us this that end <clears throat> and then on the sides by y equals negative one and y equals one so we'll just say that this right here we'll say that's y equals one and we'll say that this is y equals negative one and that allows us to create pretty nice shapes. So there's that side. There's one side. Okay, cool. So that's really the shape that we're trying to find the volume of. And it kind of looks like um it looks like a skateboarding half pipe, doesn't it? Let me let's draw our skateboarder dude. So yeah, you can imagine a guy right here on the edge. Here's our skateboarder. Oh, we'll, we'll give, him a, give him a little backwards hat. So here's our skateboarder guy on the edge of the half pipe. And this, ooh, that's a super, super sharp, super sharp edge right there. So he's about to teeter off, uh, slide down the half pipe, and we're gonna find the volume of that shape that he's, he's skating. So how, how are we gonna do that? So we know that the volume of any shape, that's equal to the triple integral over the region of integration. Oh, I'm going to run out of room. Let me move this over. Where we integrate 1, dv. And in this case, I'm going to do my normal dz, dx. Or let me do dz dy dx. Okay, so in the z direction, we enter in the xy plane, right? It even specified the xy plane is the bottom. So we know that that is z equals zero, and we exit along this kind of curved top, right? This is where we're coming out of the region, right? Along here. And that is defined by the cylinder uh, z equals y squared. It's already solved for z, so that's super easy. Now in the y direction, in the y direction, we're entering at negative one, y equals negative one, and we're exiting at one, right? That was given to us here. So that's just from negative one to one. And then in the x direction, we start at x equals zero, and we go to x equals one. So the bounds on this are relatively easy. Uh, and so if you evaluate that, you'll get the volume of that uh, half pipe. I'll let you do the evaluation on your own, uh, but the answer you're looking for is two-thirds. That's a really small half pipe if it's only two-thirds in volume. Maybe it's like two-thirds miles cubed. That would be huge. But there's no units given, so we don't know. Uh, it could be a very tiny, very tiny half pipe for a very tiny skater. So that is the, that's the answer you're looking for. Okay, let's do... Let's look at the very last problem. So here's the last one uh, that we're gonna we're gonna do. So this one is asking you to find the mass. Find the mass. So we already know we're using what formula. We know we can get mass, right? Using our mass density formula. So we just need to find that density equation. Find the mass of a cube with edge length two. And a density, ding, 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 we have our density formula. <clears throat> a density equal to the square of the distance from one of the corners. Whoa. So it doesn't give us outright a density equation. So we actually have to make it ourselves. So in this case, it's saying that the density through this shape is equal to, I can do that part, is equal to the square of the distance from one of the corners. So we have to use our distance formula. In that case, we know the distance formula is the square root of the component squared. So the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And it's asked for not just the, uh, it's not equal to the distance, but it's the, equal to the square of the distance, right? Which actually makes it easier, because then this whole thing just becomes x squared plus y squared plus z squared. 
Um, and this specifically, it's asking from, from any of the corners, from one corner. But this distance formula, right, this is the distance formula. Uh, specifically from the origin, right? So we need to make sure that the corner we're uh, choosing as the corner that we're evaluating from is is the origin. <coughs> so there we go. So we know that this is going to be the delta function, our density function that we're integrating. Now we just need to draw a picture and set up an integral. So let's draw a little picture of what's going on. So x, y, and z. So it looks like it's a cube of ed uh, with edge length 2, which is pretty easy to draw. So 2, 2, and 2. So here's, we've got this guy and this guy. Maybe this is a little bit taller than I meant for it to be. There we go. There's a cube with edge length two, um, and we're so we're asked to find the mass of it, but the density is is not uniform through it. It's it's a it's variable, uh, specifically variable is is proportional to the distance away from the origin. So we're gonna pick the origin. All right, this is the corner that we're gonna pick is is the 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 point where density is zero. Because here, it would have zero density. So it's the lightest at the origin, and the heaviest point is actually right here. So that is the densest point. It's the di whoa, densest point. Because it's the farthest away from the origin, right? And so you can imagine there's this like density gradient that runs through the shape, um, rate kind of uh, exploding outwards from the origin. So it's lightest it's lightest at the origin, and then it gets heavier the farther away it gets. So that would be the densest point. And so now we're going to set up an integral that will sum up all of those uh, micro changes in density and give us the total mass of that cube with irregular density. So let's go to our mass formula. So we know that the mass of the cube is equal to the triple integral right, over the volume we're integrating, which is the cube, of the density function with the volume differential, dv. Right, so let's set that up with actual numbers. So we have one, two, three. The bounds of this integral are going to be super easy because they all go, all of them are from zero to two, zero to two in x, y, and z. So all that's going to be is zero to two, 0 to 2, 0 to 2. Our density function is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And then we could pick any order of integration. It actually doesn't matter because all the bounds are the same. But I'll just do dz, dy, dx. Um, this is a really easy inter integral to evaluate, so I'll let you do it on your own. But the answer you're looking for is... Let me make sure I give you the right one. Let me look at my notes. 32. So the mass of that shape, the mass of that cube with that density function is 32.